Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Panorama of Hell by Hideshi Hino. This is some sick shit. This is great uh, horror manga, really twisted. Um, if you're familiar with Junji Ito, the modern day master of horror manga. This is so beyond that. This is like full-on underground comic shit. You know, uh, Ito is very slick, very polished style. I mean, I love him, but this stuff is like, like outsider art. This is like, is this guy insane? If I, It's almost like you read this and you're like, I think the author must be slightly mad. But, um, so this came out in, uh, originally in Japan in 1982. Uh, this American edition, one of the earliest manga graphic novels, is, uh, from 89. From, uh, Blast First Publishing. Blast Books, I should say. And, uh, they did, uh, Mr. Arashi's Freak Show, which, well, I did a video of it, but YouTube made me take it down. But what, once I get my Patreon up, which is taking me a fucking, like, six months, I can't figure out how to post videos on it. But the video is there, and it will be posted. But fortunately, this one is just horrifically gory. There's no sex in it. So I could show it on YouTube, because in America, we don't care about gore or horror or violence. But uh, we care about boobies. So, uh, Panorama of Hell. So, because this is the earliest graphic novel, even though it's the Western style of the cover being on the front, as, as we call it, the front. Uh, in Japan, they were called the back. But the cover is in the front, but it's still read backwards, if you will. I'm just saying that as a Westerner, <laughs> what we think of as backwards. So it actually starts from the end. Just, you can get a sense of his undergroundness. Like this is like Rory Hayes stuff. You know, it's definitely not trying to be realistic. It's like this hyper crazed psychotic art, basically. Let's crack it open, shall we? We have the translators here. Apparently one of them is named Screaming Mad George. <laughs> kind of odd. So we start off with this little anonym, anonymous classical Chinese poet. Uh, a poem. Oh, hell, come to my side. Oh, hell, come to my side, embrace me. The smell of blood, I would die for it. Oh, hell, my home. Oh, hell, my father. Oh, hell, my mother. Oh, hell, my life. Oh, hell. So, we can already tell this is going to be a very transgressive narrative. And uh, that sums up this narrator. He's the protagonist of this graphic novel he's a painter and he's a painter obsessed with the color of blood he definitely has a thing about blood he actually gets the blood from himself to paint he cuts himself and takes the blood and makes these hellish paintings. As you can see, it's like very cartoony art. You know, it's not like Ito. It's very like undergroundy, but it kind of adds to the horror. So he's basically uh, creating his life's work, this giant canvas called the Panorama of Hell. 
It depicts the end, he says. Oh, it's so nasty. He drinks hydrochloric acid and vomits up big blood clots every morning because he needs a vast amount of blood to finish this masterpiece. So he basically, this is, it's a, you know, it's a graphic novel, but it's really kind of an anthology with this narration, with this framing device. It's almost like that old show Night Gallery on, uh, you know, the early 70s, where like all these stories are like, let me show you another painting I've done, one of my hell paintings. And then there's a story. So the first one is uh, a painting of the guillotine that towers over my house. So this is obviously like some weird fantasy Japan. I don't think any town, even back in like whatever the 1600s was like this. But apparently this guy lives right near a gu gu guillotine. And every night, like, I don't know, scores of people are guillotined. And then every time they kill someone, fireworks light up the night sky. <laughs> it's crazy. They just show a bunch of first head, second head, third head, every time the fireworks. All the severed heads are collected in a large hopper from which they are dumped into, into a gondola car. This hideous work goes on all night long. And the whole time the fireworks are going off. The train carrying the severed heads vanishes, drives away. The tracks are stained with blood. Sucking up the blood, a hell flower blooms, then another. So I don't know if, I think these exist only here. <laughs> these blood flowers that grow from the condemned criminal's blood. They have fruits, these flowers, little berries, kind of. They're like blood fruit. Supposedly, whoever eats them will go mad. But uh, this narrator is not like you or I. He's like, I've always wanted to enter the world of madness by eating the red fruit of hell. So he partakes of them often. So now we see the second painting, The Bottomless River of Hell. Basically the second chapter. Hell River runs alongside the railroad that we just saw. The water is red from the blood running down from the railroad tracks and innumerable human and animal carcasses bob up and down in the never ending stream of garbage and debris. I don't know if this is a shout out to his own work, but there's some manga here. A samurai manga, it looks like. Maybe that's, you know, I don't know. So there's animals that live on the shore that feed off of the rotting carcasses and they feed off each other too. So he sh he uh, is gonna show off the next painting. It's about the crematorium next door. The crematorium of headless corpses. So they burn the corpses in this crematorium Seems very efficient. It's like this uh, efficient factory. The sight of fresh corpses boiling is remarkable. Suddenly, some of them begin to rise like dancing shrimp or squid. Oh my God. We're like 15 pages in. This is just such a fucking nightmare. <laughs> it's going to get worse, believe me. This guy's such a weirdo, he always asks the workers there, like, can I look through the porthole and watch the bodies? It's so exciting, dripping fat, crumbling bones. <laughs> the graveyard of executed prisoners. So 
So that's his next painting. You want to make sure these pages aren't sticking. So apparently all of these executed prisoners, there's a graveyard. And for some reason, they, they're given a, you know, a crappily built little cross with two sticks and some twine. But they put the skull of a dead animal on every one. It's just the tradition. All different animals, you know, pig, a dog, cat. Ghosts of the beheaded corpses rise from their graves every night, looking for their heads. They try on all the animal heads and they're, they know, they're like, this is my head. <laughs> their heads are long gone, as we saw. So this guy's a collector of just like horrible, like crazy, things that he puts in formaldehyde. We got a two-headed fish, some of these hit pig heads. This guy's really twisted. He takes one of the pickled pig's heads out and licks it. Ay. So now he says, now I'll tell you about the paintings of my family. First, I'll show you the paintings of my kids, the dream of crazy boy. That's his son. And, uh, but first we see the daughter come in. Crazy girl. And she's like, could you look at my drawing, daddy? Is this any good? And she's just like the father. She's just drawing these horrific, violent drawings. She's like a little girl. Of course, the father is very proud and like, oh, wonderful work. I guess she takes after me. So Crazy Girl loves to just stay inside all day drawing her crazy things. But she basically like collects the rotten kitten heads and dead puppies she gets from Hell River and draws them. And collects books by the weirdest comic book artists. And it has a little note here by the translator, all books by Hideshi Hino. So he does a little shout out to himself, all of his crazy horror manga. She read them over and over, and they would make little shadow puppet plays of the comic book she read for her younger brother. And of course he loves it. They're all fucking crazy, this family. They're all twisted. He doesn't stay inside like a sister. He loves to run around and play on Hell River and torture the animals that live by the river. He's a total sick fuck. He likes to sneak into the neighborhood slaughterhouse and p take the eyes out of the pigs. He loves eating these eyes. He just licks them actually like lollipops. He's a fucking pervert. So he tells his dad, Dad, they're mounting a panda head in the graveyard tomorrow for one of the graves. I'm going to steal it so you, you can put it in your collection. And he's like, oh, I've never been so proud. <laughs> yeah, it's like, they're like the Adams family. They're like a manga <laughs> Adams family. The kids, when they fight, they scratch each other till they bleed. And the father just laughs. Next is Hell Tavern. And uh, the narrator says, this is the painting of my wife. She runs a tavern on Main Street. It's called Hell Tavern. Apparently, I don't know how they have money, but her only customers are the ghosts from the graveyard, these headless ghosts. And, you know, every night she says, like, what would you like for an appetizer? And these guys are like, my hand. So she cuts off their hand. But then they're like, but we can't eat this. It smells delicious, but we have no mouth. 
I like how one guy orders ass sashimi. <laughs> I guess he chops off a little, uh, some pieces of his ass. Seriously, like raw to him. But of course, they're like, I don't have a mouth. So she grabs her knife and she makes slits in their throats of all different shapes so they can eat. And they, it works. They're like shoving food down the, their throat wounds and like mm, this is delicious so now we have three generations of, of tattoos part one the snake man and this is about his grandfather this is a little small trilogy within the graphic novel his grandfather was a roving gambler and uh, he was Yakuza, so he had this tattoo of a snake on his back. Everyone called him Snake Man. So he barely was ever home. So his poor grandmother had to raise the kids by himself. He was always off gambling. He'd return for holidays whenever he, and when he, when he like was successful at gambling, He'd bring home a trunk full of presents and tons of money that he won. But usually when he came back, like most gamblers, the majority of times he'd lost. He looked like a bum. He was half starved. So the mother like had to work the fields. I mean, she basically did everything. She supported all these, the whole family. The father was a very abusive drunk and would take it out on his wife, the grandmother. It almost seems like the way he draws it that like maybe it was some crazy S&M thing, like she was into it. I don't know, it's nuts. So um, the narrator's father and sister begin to hate him. They don't get the complex dynamics of whatever sexuality. They're just like, her father's always beating her mother. So one night, uh, the, the father, with the narrator's grandfather, I should say, gets in a dispute with some gamblers. And they get the best of him. But he's still alive. They're like amazed. It's like we cut him to shreds and the guy's laughing. And he says, I am the snake man. I will not be killed by you pieces of shit. And he slashes his own belly. And all these dice come out. See, this is the thing where it's not like Ito. Where Ito has crazy concepts, but they kind of logically progress. This is just high surrealism. Like, like really like Grand Gould. Gugnol. I don't know how to say that word. Grand Gugnol. Horror. Just anything can happen in these. So he's licking the dice. He's all like, oh, dice. And he's trying to eat them. Even though he's dying. And he does die, though, finally. So the grandma... Grandmother is murdered the following spring. That's, look at this craziness. She's like upside down in a well. I guess a crazy, a pervert from the village brutally murdered her. So uh, the narrator's parents are now orphans and they are sent away to different places to work. And now we see Part two of three generations of tattoos, the Crimson Bat. So now we're the narrative's father. He was just kind of like his dad. He'd drink himself into a stupor every day, total alcoholic, very surly alcoholic. But his thing was he had a bat, a Crimson Bat tattooed on his back.
So he has a very traumatic childhood, you know, like working for these people as an orphan. This crazy interlude here where he was hired to like feed this crazy son of a couple who lived in the attic. He was like, oh, we need help. He's pretty crazy, you gotta feed him. And this guy would like make, force him to finish his food so his parents wouldn't say, now nah, you didn't finish your food, you're in trouble. Like he would drool into it and drip snot and this poor little kid had to eat it. Even once he vomits, vomits it up and he says, you have to eat it so my parents don't know I'm not eating. And the son actually kills him. <laughs> He's finally fed up. He bashes in his head with a hammer. I mean, it's kind of self-defense. I mean, the family is not even that mad at him. They're like, uh, we're kind of glad to be rid of our insane son, but you still gotta go. So he goes to see his sister and the sister's dead. Apparently the family that she was fostered to worked her so hard that she died of pneumonia. So he grew up becoming a vagabond gambler, almost like his dad. Just drinking all the time, gambling. But uh, he says he doesn't want to end up like his dad. So he sails to Manchuria to seek his fortune and make something of himself. He marries there, works really hard, starts a pig farm that's very successful. But then Japan in, invades Manchuria. <coughs> Excuse me. So the narrator's father, you know, this is the little, the narrator, kind of looks like he, he has those weird eyes. His father just hates, hates him. He brutalizes him any chance he gets. He's all like, I fucking hate the way you look at me. And whenever he drinks sake, he got even more violent. Like he really has this feral hatred of his own son. Something about the way he looks at him. This son is a weirdo. But he's just like, ah, you're always staring at me. You aren't a human child, you're a demon son. Sorry, I forgot to mention, I love this little touch. Whenever his father would beat him, he would see a crimson bat rise above, above his father as if the tattoo was coming to life. So his father works at the slaughterhouse. And one day he goes to visit his father at the, his job and he sees his father with like blood all over his body from, you know, he probably, bashed in like 500 pigs heads that day. And he's like, my father looked like something from the depths of hell. It was kind of traumatic to see his father like that. And while his father's in this state, this murderous state, he sees the crimson bat tattoo, like start to dance on his father's back. Then one wintry day, he sees his father floating down Hell River among all the garbage. They don't tell us what happened, why, how he died. Part three of three gener generations of tattoos, the rising dragon. And this is about the narrator's brother. Very much like his grandfather and his father. He's an alcoholic. But he's a little different. He's an incredibly violent guy. Like he he's a juvenile delinquent who loves to get into fights. And when he gets in a fight, he showed no mercy. He would beat people sorry, beat people till they were unconscious. He's a very angry, violent young guy. Always starting fights, or at the very least, ending the fights.
So one night he's found in the snow and he's half dead. And then he goes into a coma. And he remembers back when they were kids, like his brother, even though he's, you know, he's a violent fighter. But when they were little kids, he would always run to his brother's aid when the father was brutalizing him. And then the father would beat him up. And of course, all he could do was watch. He wasn't as brave as his brother. So it almost be kind of relieved that the brother was taking the beating, even though he felt bad about it. When the neighborhood punks bullied him, his brother would run in and be like, stop it. Even though he's like a little cute kid. <laughs> it is weird. His horrific art style, Hideshi Hon, you know, he draws really cute little kids. <laughs> These kids are so adorable. And once again, uh, the protagonist would be excused from getting beat up. Because his brother was getting beat up and he wasn't, he would just watch, kind of be like, Ugh. So his brother was a really good guy. I mean, he was his brother's defender. And the protagonist, the narrator, is just like feeling, feels, still feels terrible about it. He's like, I didn't do anything for you, nothing. I couldn't come out of my shell. All I could do is my stupid paintings. So the brother, after he gets released from the hospital, he's, um, it's not really explained, but he's just this fleshy lump. Like he doesn't even have a head anymore, or arms or legs, but the tattoo's still there. It's just whatever. I mean, this whole thing is like a nightmare. It doesn't really have logic. And every night he'd moan and writhe in agony. Next, he shows us a painting of his mother, the mad woman. And we see her now, you know, he's an adult. And the mother lives with him. And she's just fucking dement, demented. But he uh, has a flashback to when he was little. She was kind of crazy. She's like singing to pig, pig's heads. And she was very kind to him as a baby, but at a certain age, she just started torturing him. You son of a hell demon, I'm going to get you. Tearing out his hair. She beat him worse than the father did. She would stab him with this little pick. I mean, it's horrific. Of course, the brother would defend him. But he was always able to calm her down. It's not like the mother would attack him. She'd be like, oh, okay, whatever. Now back to the more present when the mother's very old. And she still loves her lump son. <laughs> the older son who's the big lump now. And she still... She loves him, but she also, like, abuses him. Sometimes whips him. And the the protagonist's children, her grandchildren, will be like, Grandma, stop it. Leave Uncle alone. And she'll be like, oh, I don't know where I am. <laughs> she doesn't really know what she's doing. She's completely demented. So now we see the lost empire. And uh, this isn't about any painting. So I guess um, the, when the first nuclear bomb went off in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, a single beam swept over Korea to Manchuria, where he was in his mother's, well, until then, he was in his mother's womb. 
I'm sorry, after then. And it's almost like he thinks that, like, that is his father. Like, he was born, or what's the word, seeded by the nuclear bomb flash. So then, um, you know, once the Japanese were defeated, the Chinese, the Japanese who had uh, occupied Manchuria, they were uh, persona non grata. Everyone was like, oh, let's start killing those Japanese. His father was saved by a friend. So in 1946, amid, amid all this chaos, our protagonist was born. And he already is like a monster. The people at the hospital are like, it's horrible. What is this child? The person at the hospital actually says, you mustn't raise it. No one would blame you if you kill it now. So nine months later, my parents carried me in the line of refugees retreating to Japan because all the Japanese nationals had to get the hell out of Manchuria. They definitely weren't welcome. We said another little poem about hell. So while they're escaping, uh, you know, there's lots of death. People are either committing suicide or the Manchurians are attacking people because they're the enemy. And the little baby sees this dead woman and starts licking at her blood. He loves it. And everyone else is like, what the hell kind of kid is this? It's a demon baby. Maybe we should kill him. The father says that even. She's like, no, we can't kill him. But then more Japanese, I'm sorry, more Manchurians show up and attack the Japanese uh, nationals. And something happens where they they hit the mother and she starts bleeding and it, it drives her insane. She's been being strong for this whole time during this, all this crisis. But just seeing her own blood... She fucking goes mad. Never comes back from it. That's when she goes crazy. So he's on the ship to Japan and he sees Manchuria crumbling. Like Japan's attacking it for the last time. Dreams of a young painter. And we see the protagonist as a youngster. And he's talking about all the little games he played. And he's basically a serial killer in training. He chopped the legs off lizards, boil cats, grind up bugs, pull feathers from crows. This is a fucking sick little kid. And then every day he would draw pictures of the things he did. Of course, his father didn't like it. He's like, you little shit, I should have killed you in Manchuria. But even as a little kid, he's like, I didn't fear these beatings. They gave me more inspiration for my hell paintings. So from a very young age, he's a total artist and he's got this whole, you know, oeuvre he envisions that he wants to do. But after a while, he got really bored and the images for his hell painting stopped. So he realized he might have to create his own uh, scenarios. So he thinks to himself, boy, I wish that creep's house down the street would catch on fire. This kid who picks on him lives down the street. Then I could paint a really amazing hell painting. 
And he makes this mushroom cloud sculpture and pours the blood of animals he sacrificed onto it. It starts glowing with a weird pink light. And he prays to it, basically. He says, please make his house burn down. And all of a sudden, it makes a sound like boom. And he immediately hears fire. And it worked. It's almost like he has this godlike power through this ritual. He made this happen. He's laughing. Everyone else is like, ah, this is horrible. He's like, he. He's so happy that his nemesis and his family burned to death. So, filled with glee, I went right inside and sketched the scene. So, he got another hell painting. And he realizes that, like, from then on, he would wish for these tragedies to happen so he could make hell paintings. We see these headlines from newspapers. Five boat sinks, 800 dead, double train wreck, death toll 163. So, he, like, realized he does have this, like, weird godlike power. But he just cares about it so he can make more hell paintings, be inspired. He basically uh, surmises that he's killed thousands of people over the years just so he can make his hell paintings. But now he wants to do his masterpiece, the panorama of hell. So we have panorama of the final hell. So he realizes, uh, basically it implies that he started the Falkland War through his powers. And he was like, wow, my power was just as strong in foreign countries. So now he realizes like, okay, I can influence anything. I'm gonna press the button and set off all the world's nuclear, bu nuclear buttons. And then I'll be able to paint my final hell painting. It will be the spectacular, the accumulation of all my life's work. And uh, he realizes, though, he's, he's going to need a lot of blood sacrifice. So he goes and kills his cute little kids. She's like, I must paint it, even if it means sacrificing you. Then he goes to his wife and he chops her up. And this is where it gets very, now we're getting like, this was already a fucking weird graphic novel. This gets very like beyond weird. Cause we realize, look at his wife. Can you see that? The lines, he chops her up. It was a statue all along. I guess I kind of think he never had a wife. He had this mannequin. I don't know if the kids the same. Yeah, the kids the same thing. We never even realized that. We kind of were looking at reality through his eyes and kind of believed his reality. No, he's a fuck more psycho than we ever thought. He has no wife. He has no kids. They're all fucking mannequins. His kids are little puppets here. Maybe that's all they ever were. He slaughters them anyway. The puppet kids. And he says, uh, now I'm gonna get your grandmother, my mother. And he kills her. We don't even see it on panel, the gore, but we see bolts and cogs coming out of her as he chops her up. Like she's a robot grandmother or robot mother, I should say. And then his brother, remember the one who was a shapeless lump with no arms or legs or head? He, he never existed either. It's really just a rotten pig carcass he found in Hell River. He chops him up. He's just maniacally happy, laughing like a loon. Ha ha ha. And so he goes outside. That's a really nice two page spread. I love that. And now we get full on like wackadoo surreal. 
he says, we've never even mentioned this before. He's like, oh, that wall near my house. I've never seen what's on the other side. So he throws his ax at it and it shatters the wall. Interesting uh, panel sequence here. How it's got this like swoop. Whoosh. And when the wall crashes, he sees a sea of blood with this crazy mouth. So like, basically, I think what we're witnessing here is this narrator who's always kind of psycho. He's having a full mental breakdown and we're seeing what he's seeing. I don't think I've ever seen madness depicted this <laughs> intensely before. He's full on, you know, all the veils have come down and he's fucking nuts. Like more nuts than we ever imagined. The sea of blood, people are drowning in it. Look at this great, this is just amazing. I, I don't, I always say psychedelia, whatever it is, it's some crazy great abstract art. This is what his insane mind is seeing. He's having these visions of his mother and his father, his brother and his children. How they're all in this like lantern, giant lantern. And he starts vomiting up blood uncontrollably. And now it full on becomes apocalyptic. Like it's not just this crazy guy and whatever he, shit he does. He's like, hell is coming. Everything will be destroyed. A moment of awesome beauty is near. I'll paint every last scrap of this panorama of a final hell. No one on this planet will be left alive, but my hell painter will be a turtle. So he's also kind of megalomaniac. God, I can never say that word. Megalomaniacal. And now we just ratchet it up five notches. And he starts talking to us, the reader. Let me just uh, make sure it didn't start here. Yeah, he says, so I won't die. You will die. Looking, pointing right at us, the reader. You and you and you will die. You will all die. And he throws the ax at us, the reader. The readers, we should go fly through the air. <laughs> this is the last page. It's like a 3D movie. Schwack. Oh my God. I don't, I don't know if back in 1982, I guess if you were a little kid, this might've been horrifying. Like, ah, <laughs> this X is coming at me. It is fascinating though that he ends it this way. Like, it's already so fucking weird, this whole book. And then it just full on jumps over the fence into insanity. Like, full on, full blown insanity. Oh, what a weird way to end the last page. That's a weird way to end this book. Coming at you in 3D. A little uh, note about the author. And that's it, Panorama of Hell by Hideshi Hino, one of the greats of horror manga. Um, you might also know him from Hell Baby. That was another big one of his. I have that too, and uh, maybe in a little while I'll do that. Um, I'll come back to Hideshi, Hideshi Hino and review Hell Baby, but man, I haven't read this once again. I haven't read this in decades. I forgot how twisted and weird this is. This is some amazing stuff. That's the thing about Japanese horror is <clears throat> I think 
living in the West my whole life, um, I got used to the the craziest shit in Western culture, you know, um, whatever, any kind of crazy horror, um, even like nasty sex shit, uh, nun porn, <laughs> just whatever, anything kind of nutty stuff. By my mid twenties, I was like, "Yeah, I've seen all the weird shit," because I was always attracted to the weirdest shit. And then when I discovered Japanese pop culture, I was like, "Oh my god, this is a whole other level. Weird shit that I could even imagine beyond the Judeo Christian version of taboos and uh, transgressiveness. There's stuff in Japanese pop culture I don't even understand. It's just like this is just horrifying and weird." But I, like, the craziest shit in Judeo-Christian culture, I kind of get. I get, oh, yeah, you're being transgressive. You're being um, shocking in this, you know, culture. But it's, I just love Japanese stuff for that. Especially this kind of crazy shit. Where it's like, I don't know where it's even coming from. It's just bizarre, unfathomable, unfathomable craziness sorry um, I should say I'm a little drunk tonight <laughs> that's why I keep slurring sorry I'm usually a little better with my words not much but a little better so there you go Panorama of Hell I, I have no idea if this has ever been reprinted this is one of the earliest mangas ever published in America I mean this is really way before manga became hot and I hope you can find it. Maybe it's been reprinted. If not, uh, it seems pretty <laughs> doubtful that you'll find something cheap. Because Blast Books wasn't, you know, big. They were very niche, kind of a boutique type publisher. So I hope you can find it, though. It's definitely worth having, just for the insanity of it. There's not, there's not many comics like this, or f any fiction like this. So there you go. Thanks for watching. And I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.